today we're going to be looking at some more difficult SAT math prep questions. So this first question, we can see we're given this uh, table of values of x and y, and it says that the, the table gives the coordinates of two points on a line in the xy plane. So we have a line on the xy Cartesian plane, and it tells us that the y-intercept of the line is at k minus 5 as our x value and a y value of b where k and b are constants. So what is the value of b, it's asking? Well, first of all, let's remind ourselves of the equation of the line. We know that's y equals mx plus b, right? Or you could use the point slope version. Um, I prefer y equals mx plus b. Our slope is rise over run, right? which is our change in y's over our change in x's. So we can find our slope just by plugging in our, we have multiple points here, right? So why don't we use, um, let's use our table of values points, right? Because that way we don't have to introduce that variable b, just the, just the variable k for now. So our change in y, you can do whatever order you want. Let's do 13 minus negative 15, as long as you're uh, your points are kind of the same. If I do 13 minus negative 15, that means I need to start with k minus k plus 7. I can't do k plus 7 minus k if I start with 13 on the numerator. So now we do k minus k plus 7. Okay, so this gives us, we have 28 in our numerator. k's cancel out and we get minus 7 and 7 goes into 28 four times, so we get minus 4 as our slope. So we have our slope, right? We've got this guy, m, and we're looking for b. And we have three different points, right? So we can plug that, we can just plug in a point and find our value of b. So first off, let's, okay, let's notice as well, at the y-intercept, we have k minus 5 as our x value, right? And if we were to draw a Cartesian plane, this is our y, this is our x. Suppose that our line looks something like this. Our y-intercept is here, right? And the value of x is at x equals zero. So we know that k minus five should be equal to zero which tells us that k should be equal to 5, okay? Now we've got y equals mx plus b, so let's plug in a point, okay? Let's choose, uh, for example, our point k, our first point in the table, k13. So we now have y equals minus 4x plus b, our y value is 13, our x value is k. And we know that k is just 5 plus b. So we get minus 20 on our right hand side. If we move that over, we get 13 plus 20 equals b. Or 33 is equal to b. Another way that you could have solved this if you wanted is we could have said that we know that the slope is negative 4, and if we have a slope of negative 4, then well, why don't we use the point of our y-intercept for our, our slope, our rise over run, right? So we could do b, our y-value, minus 13, over, and our x-value for uh, corresponding to the y-value of b is k minus 5 minus and at 13 we have k now we can see we actually don't necessarily need to solve for k because they they'll cancel out right and remember this is slope let me move over here right so we've got now k's cancel out we have b minus 13 and then we've got uh minus 5 and you'll see we end up with the same thing. 20 plus 13 is equal to b. b is equal to 33. 
Great. Same result. Let's move to the next question. The function f of x is equal to blank. The function g is defined by g of x as f of x plus 5. For what value of x does g of x reach its minimum? OK. So first off, we know g of x already because f of x is defined. So when we have f of x plus 5, we're shifting our x values to the left by 5, right? Which is the same thing as doing f of x plus 5. We substitute all of our x, our x values from f of x as x plus 5 plus 64 times x plus 5 now, plus 262. We can expand this and simplify. So this is going to be x squared plus 10x plus 25 plus 64x plus 320 plus 262. Okay. We're going to get 4x squared plus 40x plus 64x plus 25 times 4 is 100 plus 320 plus 262. And finally, we get 4 times x squared plus 104x plus 682. So this is our value. This is our uh, g of x function, and what it's asking us is when does it reach its minimum? If you know calculus, this is very easy. You can just take the derivative of this and find the roots of the derivative. Um, if you don't know calculus, that's fine. It just means that we're going to have to complete the square in order to find the minimum. So to complete the square here, we can start by factoring out a four from our first two terms. We're going to be left with x squared plus 26 times x. Close the brackets and we'll leave it with plus 682. And now let's continue this. We've got x squared plus 26x. And now this is where we complete the square, right? We're going to do plus half of b squared. Half of b, remember b is the term that is the coefficient that's next to our x variable. That's 26. So a half of 26 is 13. Okay. So oops, let's write this as 26 over 2 squared minus 26 over 2 squared. And then let's close this off plus 682. You might be familiar with a different way of completing the square, whichever way works for you. 4 times, now we've got, actually let's, let's write this out, x squared plus 26x, 13 squared is plus 169, okay, and now let's close this off, okay, reminder we still have minus 4 times 169 plus 682. Okay, now it's a little bit more clear. We can see that we have a, 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 a binomial here, right? A binomial squared, and that's, con that's going to be x plus 13 squared, right? And if we do this math here, we'll get 4 times 169 plus 682. It's just going to be 6. So finally, we've completed our square. Looks a lot cleaner now. So what does this look like? You might be able to understand and read the solution already. But let's, let's sketch it out as well. OK. We know at, oh, and this should be a plus 6. We know when this first term here is equal to 0, we're going to be at a value of y equals 6. And that first term is equal to 0 when x is negative 13. So at negative 13, we're at a y value of 6. 
and we know that this is a upwards parabola, right? Its concavity is upwards, which means that at this value, it's going to look something like this. So we can see here at our, our minimum value is going to be at x is equal to negative 13. So option A is the correct answer here. Let's move on to the next question. Okay, the density of a certain type of wood is 353 kilograms per cubic meter. A sample of this wood is in the shape of a cube and has mass of 345 kilograms. To the nearest hundredth of a meter, what is the length of one edge of this sample? So we got a lot of information from this question. Let's just write out some of it. We know that the density of wood, we give that the variable rho, is 353, and this is kilograms per meters cubed. Okay? tells us we also have this sample of wood. It's in the shape of a cube. So all of the side lengths are the same, and it has a mass of 345 kilograms. It's asking us what's the length of one edge of the sample. So let's see what we have here. Well, we know that our density is just equal to, and we can see from the units here, the units are mass divided by volume, right? So even if we forgot, we can see from the units what our equation is for density, mass over volume. So we know that, okay, 353 is our density, 345 is our mass, and we just have volume. So we can just solve for our volume. Our volume is going to be 345 divided by 353, right? And 345, reminder, this is kilograms. Our denominator is in kilograms per meters cubed. We can verify that the units should be meters cubed, okay? Doing this math, we end up with 0 0.977 meters cubed. We also know that the volume of our sample, right, it's a cube. So its volume can be calculated by side length times three, length times width times height. Since they're all the same side length, it's just side cubed. So to find the length of one side, it's just going to be the cubed root of 0 0.977, right, meters cubed. So one side length to one hundredth, let's uh, write out what our calculator would spit out, something along these lines, right? So to the nearest hundredth is our second decimal place here. And we see that the two is not going to round it up. It's going to keep it the same at 0 0.99. So 0 0.99 should be our answer. So option B is the correct answer here. Okay, let's move on to the last question that we have. An isosceles right triangle has a perimeter of 94 plus 94 square root two inches. What is the length in inches of one leg of this triangle? Okay, let's draw out this triangle here. It tells us that it's a right isosceles triangle. So it's gonna look something like this where these side lengths are the same, okay? If this was our length, that means this other side will also be our length. You might already know what I'm gonna do here, but if you don't, let's just say that we don't know what this hypotenuse will be, and that's going to be x. So from Pythagorean theorem, we know that the hypotenuse square should be equal to the sum of the side lengths squared. So length squared plus length squared. So x squared is going to be, we have two length squares. Taking the square root of both sides, we can now get square root of two length squared 
or square root of 2 times L. So x is just the square root of one of, square root of 2 times one of our side lengths in our isosceles triangle. We know that the perimeter is going to be length plus length plus square root 2 times length. Okay, so this is going to be 2Ls plus square root of 2 times L. Okay, perfect. We can factor out an L here and we get 2 plus square root 2 times L. Okay, and we know that this is going to be equal to, it tells us in the question, 94 plus 94 root 2. So 94 plus 94 root 2. So now we can just solve for L, right? What is the length in inches of one of the legs of the triangle? And we have an equation here that's just got one variable. So we get length is equal to 94 plus 94 root 2 over 2 plus square root of 2. And unfortunately for us, this is pretty ugly. And all of our answers are in exact form. So to get our answer in exact form, what we need to do is we need to rationalize this root, or rationalize our denominator, I mean. To rationalize our denominator, what we've got to do is we need to multiply by 2 minus root 2 on both the numerator and the denominator. By doing this, we can clean up the denominator and then we can simplify and express this a lot neater. So our length is going to be equal to Okay, let's actually also factor out a 94 from our numerator. So we get 94 plus 1 plus root 2. And this is times 2 minus root 2. In the denominator, you can either expand this, you can FOIL, right? Or you can notice that this is a difference of squares, right? It's a difference of squares where we have 2 squared, or 4, minus... Right, this is just square root of two squared. Right, same thing. Okay. If that doesn't make sense, you could always foil. It'll just take a little bit longer. So now we've got ninety-four times. Now we can uh, we can foil the top or the numerator. So we get one times two is two. One times negative square root two is minus root two. We now get plus two root two. And then we got. Uh, plus root 2 times minus root 2, we're left with minus 2. All of this is divided by 4 minus 2. Almost done here. We can see we've got 94 times. Our 2's cancel out, and we are left with negative root 2 plus 2 root 2. So that's just 1 root 2. And this is divided by 2. And we know that that is just, okay, 94 over 2. Well, that's just 47. And we're left with 47 times root 2 is our length. And you can see that looks like option B is our answer for this one as well.